This video is brought to you by adamandeve.com. Use my code LSOO for 50% of one item and to get free shipping in the US and Canada. Who do you think they are to each other? This is the question that opens past lives. The first feature movie by Celine Song, as we follow a voyeuristic gaze at three strangers sitting across the bar. They won't, of course, be strangers for long. Soon we will learn exactly who they are and how their lives are intertwined. And yet, the question remains significant, for it tells us that whatever expectations we might have, things will not be as they appear at first sight. Indeed, Past Lives is a movie that goes on to quietly yet significantly subvert many tropes of the romantic genre, but it also reconstructs them into something new, something that I wasn't expecting, and which to me elevates it to one of, if not the most, beautiful love story in a long time. Past Lives can be roughly divided into three chapters. In the first one we meet Nora and Hei Sung as adolescent kids in Korea harboring a secret crush on each other. The young romance, however, isn't allowed to blossom as Nora's family emigrates to Canada. Twelve years pass. In this second chapter of the story, Nora is now a playwright in New York. Hei Sung still lives in Korea. The two reconnect over the internet, but Nora becomes increasingly worried about her growing intimacy with a person who only exists on her laptop screen. And so, she hits the brakes, and the two fall out of each other's lives again. Another 12 years pass. Now we move into the main portion of the story. Hei Sung goes on a vacation to New York where, for the first time in 20 years, he meets up with Nora who is now married to an American novelist named Arthur. You know you only speak in Korean when you talk in your sleep. At this point you might expect, as I initially did, a story in which the main conflict both with regards to the internal struggle of the central character as well as to the direction of the plot, is primarily driven by doubt. Did Nora make the right choice by marrying Arthur? Or would Hei Sung have been the better option? Who does she love more? Who is she going to end up with? You know, it's the path as laid out by movies such as Before Sunset, in which two former lovers meet again after not having seen each other for nine years prompting a re-evaluation of their life choices that eventually culminates into a new crossroad, a new moment of decision making. And more specifically, it presents a new chance to make the right choice. Because if you had seen the previous movie before Sunrise, you already knew these two have great chemistry. And seeing how they are still so great together years later while also learning how unfulfilled their lives have been without each other, the movie almost naturally creates this sense of destiny. This feeling that these two, despite having been momentarily kept apart by circumstance, are just meant to be together. I was just thinking about what a good story this is. Childhood sweethearts who reconnect 20 years later only to realize they were meant for each other. Past lives, on the other hand, subverts this expectation by deliberately calling attention to it. In the story I would be the evil white American husband standing in the way of destiny. Shut up. It does this not to display how meta-aware it is about the tropes of the genre, but to emphasize that this is a different kind of story, with a different focus and with a different tension. Indeed, though presenting us with what appears to be a love triangle that will eventually favor the two characters who have the more beautiful story and therefore have fate and the audience on their side, at no point is there any real suspense that this might actually happen that there's going to be another grand moment of choice. Nora makes it very clear, both to Arthur and to us in the audience, that there's no way that she would run off with Heisung. Do you even know me? I'm not gonna miss my rehearsals for some dude. And so, when Nora and Heisung finally reunite, there just isn't that same atmosphere as there is in Before Sunset. There isn't that same gravitational pull that has us yearning for these childhood lovers to actually upset their lives and be together. And yet, there clearly is a strong emotion here. A feeling of bittersweet melancholy that does feel adjacent to words like doubt, longing or regret. But none of these truly seem to capture what past lives is trying to articulate. Doubt is generally seen as a form of worrying, you know, worrying whether or not you made a correct decision. 
It's about weighing options in terms of right and wrong, like would Nora have been happier if her family never moved out of Korea? Would a life with Haesung have been more fulfilling? Which also feeds into that underlying assumption of destiny or fate. The idea that there was a better path, a right path out there that we may have missed. And that now fills us with regret. 부부가 됐을까? But while the movie allows its characters to ask questions like these, allows them to wonder about what might have been, it feels like it also wants to demonstrate just how limiting of a framework our language can be when trying to articulate what it really feels like, what it really means, to look back on the choices that shaped our lives, and to contemplate where we are and who we are in the present. It's a deconstruction that begins by considering how our lives are not just directed by decisions that we made, but also, and maybe even more so, by those that were made for us. I feel so not Korean when I'm with him, but also in some way more Korean. In his review of the movie, Carlos Aguila draws attention to the implications of Nora's childhood immigration. There's a unique emotional displacement that happens to people who migrated when they were old enough to have forged memories of life in their homeland, but still young enough to be remolded by a new environment. As the years mount and you become someone else somewhere else, that previous existence, now so distant from your current reality, begins to fade into a corner of your subconscious, covered in the cobwebs of nostalgia. In this context, it becomes even clearer that Nora's reunion with Haesong is not about the future. He doesn't re-enter her life as a potential new direction for her to go in. Instead, he's more of a bridge to the past, one that undeniably rekindled a part of Nora's history and identity that had been dormant for many years, but also one that affirmed just how estranged she has become from it. He's so Korean. I mean, I have Korean friends, but he's not like... Korean-American, he's Korean-Korean. By emphasizing the definitiveness of time, the way it solidified Nora's past into a part of her being that she will always carry with her, while also grounding her so firmly in her current existence that she can never truly return to it. Past lives becomes less about what could have been, even less so about what should have been, and more about how what is came to be about how it defined who we are, and about reconciling ourselves with the way time eventually narrows down the boundless potential for possible life directions into a concrete and singular reality. And while there is definitely some element of grief involved in becoming aware of this movement, and in the inevitable contemplation of all the lives that weren't lived, all the places that weren't stayed in, and all the connections that were broken, as critic Richard Lawson wrote, Past lives is not concerned with regret. It is instead a thoughtful, humane rumination on what may be fixed in personal history, but remains forever fluid in the mind. You dream in a language that I can't understand. It's like there's this whole place inside of you where I can't go. It's essentially a search for meaning, for understanding, perhaps even for justification, one that can be defined by replacing what if for why. Why is it that we are who we are? Why aren't we someone else, somewhere else, and with somebody else? It's questions like these that go beyond that imagining or that longing for what we might have missed out on, and also relate to feelings of insecurity about what we did end up with. For what does it really mean, as Arthur seems to wonder at one point, to have something if the only reason you have it is because of a series of arbitrary circumstances that may as well have gone in an entirely different direction. What if you met somebody else at that residency? What if there was another writer from New York who had also read all the same books you had? Wouldn't you be laying here with him? That's not how life works. Uh, it does seem to take the romance out of the love story a little bit. The idea that our relationships are primarily defined by random chance, 
that one tiny alteration in our past could have prevented us from even meeting those who we now can't imagine living without. And perhaps even more confronting, the realization that this alternative life wouldn't have been meaningfully different. That our loved ones would have just met other people, made different connections, fallen in love and lived out their lives with someone else, never even knowing we existed. It makes it only natural that we worry about what this means for our current relationships, and that we start to experience those more what-if kind of doubts that we talked about earlier. It's just that you make my life so much bigger, and I'm wondering if I do the same thing for you. You do. This is where I ended up. This is where I'm supposed to be. Here, the movie does something interesting by seemingly reintroducing the idea of destiny, albeit its own version of destiny, presented here as the Korean notion of inyon. It means providence, or fate. But it's specifically about relationships between people. Inyon, as Nora explains it, suggests that every encounter between people in their past lives, even if it's just a moment of accidentally brushing your clothes with a stranger, forms an inyon, a sort of spiritual connection. These connections then accumulate over the ages, and when two people have acquired enough of them, 8,000 of them to be precise, that's when they find each other, and that's when they can live happily ever after. Yeah, wouldn't that make this... At first glance, it definitely feels like it brings back some of the romanticism that got lost in the deconstruction of the predestined love story. But at the same time, it also feels more nuanced, more retrospective than the kind of destiny that explicitly or implicitly grabs us in the beginning and has us rooting for its manifestation in the future. In past lives, the concept of inyon is not used to reach some kind of definitive judgement, to either celebrate the achievement of destiny or to mourn having missed out on it. Instead, it's more about emphasizing the importance of reaching a sort of peaceful resignation, the importance of acknowledging that anything could have been anything else, while still finding closure in what actually is. The real reason why past life stands out so much to me personally, however, is because it doesn't end with one idea taking over the other. It's not all dreamy, nor is it fully grounded in stark realism. But instead it balances both of these elements together as two sides of the same coin. As two ways of reflecting on our lives and ourselves that, as contradictory as they can be, somehow still come to simultaneously inhabit our mind as we grow older. And as frustrating as it can be to find yourself caught between romanticism and nihilism, between being aware that your life might be the way it is for totally arbitrary reasons, and still having it mean the world to you. As the characters in past lives demonstrate, there is a harmony to be found, as Richard Lawson put it, in that beautiful mingling of all of our wistful, pragmatic adult understanding, and that otherworldly sense that we are all floating on the winds of fate. Lastly, I think it's important to point out that Past Lives is not just about the love story between Nora and Heisung, but is as much, if not more so, about that between Nora and Arthur. Though being somewhat understated, there's a quiet beauty in their mutual acceptance of the fact that we can never fully encapsulate those closest to us, that there will always be parts of them that we cannot access. But more importantly, they also demonstrate how this doesn't have to be an obstacle in our relationships, but can actually be a path towards greater intimacy. The guy flew 13 hours to be here. I'm not going to tell you that you can't see him or something. He's your childhood sweetheart. Throughout the story, 
Arthur displays a tremendous amount of support, open-mindedness and trust that enables Nora to freely explore that unresolved part of herself existing outside of their relationship. And he even accompanies her during that exploration. Manaso, Pangawayo. Uh, hi, uh, nice to meet you, Asa. And this not only allows Nora to make peace with her past for herself, but it also brings it into her unity with Arthur, makes him a part of that which was once inaccessible to him, leaving their relationship stronger than ever before. You and me. Yeah, yeah, you and I are in Yen too. <laughs> If, after all of this, you feel inspired to grow closer with your partner, or just explore the world of love on your own with an open mind and an open heart, I suggest heading over to Adam and Eve, a company that, like past lives, will for sure help you on your way to greater intimacy. Remember to use my code LSOO for 50% of one item and to get free shipping in the US and Canada. So yeah, just go have a look and have fun. Wow. Thank you.